Tonight we're in chapter 8 of Ezekiel, and this is a very, a very powerful chapter as we look at it. it. I chose to entitle this particular installment in our study here in Ezekiel, Is It a Trivial Thing? And you're going to see where that comes from in just a moment as we go through this chapter together. But let's begin reading in Ezekiel at chapter 8 at verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 4, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. Then I looked, and there was a likeness like the appearance of fire from the appearance of his waist and downward fire, and from his waist and upward like the appearance of brightness like the color of amber. He stretched out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my hair, and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the plain." Now, as we enter into this particular section in chapter 8, we need to know that this this chapter actually introduces a new section of the book because chapters 8 through 11 all contain visions that the Lord gives to this man, this prophet, a man by the name of Ezekiel. Now, we saw in chapters 3 through 7 that God was giving him warnings of a coming judgment against Judah and Jerusalem. So the visions that are contained in chapters 8 through 11 are going to apply to Jerusalem and what remains of Judah. And what we see is really a a warning. It's a warning to the Jews in Babylon. God is about to bring judgment. He's bringing judgment for their sins. And if they do not repent, there's going to be a final and complete exile from the land of promise. That's what he's saying here in the following chapters. Now, as we begin here in verse 1, notice with me just a couple basic things. He says, it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah, sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. And so he begins by simply giving us the date. It's a careful, uh, he carefully gives us this date, by the way. It's equivalent to the months of August or September, and the year would be 592 B.C. So this would make it around 14 months after he had received the first vision that we had seen in chapter 1. And so this is some time later. And we know that he's in his home. He's in his home in a a region called Tel Aviv, and he's with some of the elders of Judah who are seated before him. And it may be that these elders have gathered before him because they're wanting to know what what God has to say. It may be that they're interested in what's going to take place in the city of Jerusalem. And as even as these elders are there before him, he tells us that the hand of the Lord God fell upon him. And so the Lord begins to do something. God begins to move on this man, Ezekiel. And it says in verse 2, He looked and there was a likeness like the appearance of fire from the appearance of His waist and downward fire and from His waist and upward like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. He has a, a vision and what He's doing is describing something that He's already described to us. And we saw this earlier in chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. It's the same kind of appearance that He's seen. And what he's seen is, is, is the Lord, and, and the Lord is ministering. It says in verse 3, He stretched out the form of a hand, took me by a lock of my hair. The Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem. And so this tells us that what he's having is a spiritual experience. It's not that he is necessarily physically being transported from Babylon to Jerusalem, but it would seem that he's receiving a vision of things that are taking place there in the city of Jerusalem. And and what it does, what happens is, it says that he's taken to the door of the north gate of the inner court where the seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there like the vision that I saw in the plain. And so what you have here is a vision that's taking place, and we're going to look at this in detail, where God has brought him to the temple area in the, in the um, city of Jerusalem, and he's there by the court of the priests. And while he's there in this region that is, is set apart, in this place that's set apart, and this is all a vision, he doesn't leave Babylon. He's transported in a spiritual sense there. He's seen Jerusalem. 
But as he's there, he begins to see two things, and we're going to look at this. One is he sees, and I want you to see how he describes it. He says, it's the seat of the image of jealousy. So there are two things he sees. One is the seat of the image of jealousy, and two, in verse 4, he sees the glory of the God of Israel. And so what you have here as he begins to explain this vision that God gave to him is one that, that he's going to see something. It's idolatry. We'll see that in a moment. What he's speaking about is an idol, an idol that is there in the temple. But even while there's an idol there in the temple area, he still sees something by contrast. He sees the glory of God. God has not yet departed is the point he's making. God is still present with the nation of Israel. He's still present with them there in Jerusalem. He's still present there in that temple. But in the temple, there is something that, that he refers to as the, the image of jealousy. Now, the reason this is called the image of jealousy, as he says, where the seed of the image of jealousy was, the reason it's referred to as the image of jealousy is because it provokes the Lord God to jealousy. Interestingly, when you see the Lord speaking about himself in the Old Testament, he says, for example, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. God actually says, my name is Jealous, and I have a jealousy over the nation of Israel. I'll explain that in just a moment. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, he says, the Lord your God is a consuming fire a jealous God. Now, why would God describe himself as, and why would God be described as, a jealous God? Now, the reason that he is described as a jealous God and calls himself a jealous God is because God loves the nation of Israel. God had chosen the nation of Israel and set his affection on that nation out of all the nations on the earth. And God had chosen to give them advantages God gave them his word. God gave them visions. God gave them the temple. God gave them the priesthood. God gave them so many things. And as God gave that nation of Israel all those things, God had a relationship with them that was one that would be described in Scripture as, as a love that he had for them. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 7, verses 6 through 8, listen to what it says. You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He says the Lord loves you. God had a relationship with the nation of Israel, a relationship that he described as a love relationship. As I mentioned to you before, you can see this clearly in various passages of the Old Testament, especially can see it uh, in, in a type in the book of Hosea, God has a relationship with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament where he refers to the nation as, as his wife. And, and when they begin to pursue idolatry, when they move into idolatry, God speaks to them as being adulteresses. They are having a foreign relationship with someone who's only using them and doesn't love them. And so from that perspective, when you read the Old Testament and you see what God is speaking about here, what he's doing is he's saying, listen, in the temple area that was set apart for the worship of God, where the priesthood had been established so that they could bring sacrifices to keep the people of Israel right before God, in that area where the priests were supposed to do all the work of, of, of of intervention and intercession, encouragement to these people to love God with all of their heart in the place that God had chosen to meet with them. This is where they set up an idol. This is where a rival affection has been established in the nation of Israel. And so, on the one hand, there is an image of jealousy there 
because it provokes God to jealousy, and yet on the other hand, it's where the glory of the God of Israel is. And so what you're having developed here is a contrast because he has a love for these people, but these people do not have a love for him. So he loves them, but they're provoking him to jealousy by pursuing idolatry. The point is, in contrast, is, is he should have been worshipped instead of that idol that was there in the temple. It says in verse 5, he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now toward the north. And so I, I lifted my eyes toward the north, and, and there, north of the altar gate, was this image of jealousy in the entrance. And so he's seen something. He's seen this image, this, this image of idolatry that the people are beginning to, to uh, or have been worshiping and all. And, and now we're going to be seeing some things that, that God believes is very important for the nation to know and for Ezekiel especially to understand. Notice verse 6. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here? to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now, turn again. You will see greater abomination. So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And then he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations which they're doing there. So I went in and saw, and there, every sort of creeping thing, abominable, abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And, and there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. And in their midst stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols. For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And he said to me, turn again, and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. To my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see the greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They were worshiping the sun toward the east. He said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Well, here we go again. Very cheery portion of Scripture. He speaks concerning wicked abominations. Notice verse 6. He said, Son of man, do you see what they are doing the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Abominations. An abomination in its proper context here, the Hebrew word simply means a disgusting thing. Do you see this disgusting thing? When the word abomination is used in the Old Testament, it has two connotations. One, the word abomination can be used in a ritual sense. It speaks of unclean foods. It speaks of idols. It can even speak of, uh, of mixed marriages. God would say that, that in, the, in the Old Testament, when a Jewish individual who was to be under the covenant of God, relationship with God, when a Jewish individual would marry a, a Gentile with no relationship with God, he would call that marriage an abomination. God didn't honor those marriages because the Jews were not to intermarry. They were not to have marital relationships with pagans. The same kind of thing, by the way, is seen in the New Testament, this, this prohibition, this forbidding of unequal yoking, this forbidding of a believer in God 
through Jesus Christ in the New Testament to, to be married to, to one who doesn't know the Lord. You find that both in the old and the new as, as a principle. You see that God is saying that that is an abomination. That isn't a right relationship. Why? Because the people who have relationship with God are going to worship God in spirit and in truth. And, and, and how can a person who doesn't know the Lord have a, 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 a relationship like that with somebody who supposedly does? And so you see in the old as well as the New Testament that those intermarriages were called abominations. And so one, when it speaks concerning this abomination, do you see the abominations? One, it can speak of that which is not kosher. It can speak of idolatry. But there's also an ethical sense that this word is used, and it speaks of great wickedness. And so what the Lord is basically pointing out is the wickedness that is there in the nation of Israel, and it is being represented by the idolatry that the nation has found itself captured by. It's interesting how the Lord works with Ezekiel. I was reading these verses here, and, and I want you to notice that, that he, he says things like, do you see? He says, you will see three times. He says, go in and see, and have you seen? So he says, have you seen three times? And so when he says that, do you see, or will you see, or go in and see, that, that's kind of a common thing that you see when prophets are being addressed by God. God said those kinds of things. Do you see? He, he said that to Jeremiah. He said that to Amos. He said that to Zechariah. He wants them to see what he sees. And what God is doing here with Ezekiel is he's saying, I want to show you something. Now, this is an important point. This is really something that, that I hope that I can bring, bring home here to us tonight. This is a real important point where he's wanting Ezekiel to understand why judgment is coming. Listen, Ezekiel, do you see what they're doing? I'm showing you what they're doing, these abominations, these disgusting things, this wickedness that is taking place. Yes, you have been taken and you're in Babylon and I have transported you to see what's taking place at the temple in Jerusalem, the most holy site on the face of the earth where God meets with man. I want you to see what they're doing. I want you to understand this because, listen, when you understand what disgusts the Lord, when you understand what grieves God, when you understand what God forbids and why He forbids that, when you begin to understand that, your ministry is going to take off because you're on the same page with God at that point. But when you have this attitude, what's the big deal? doesn't really matter. Well, God is a God of grace. It doesn't. When you have that kind of attitude, you're not going to be used by the Lord because what He wants you to see is the things that He sees. God wants you to have a heart that He has. God wants Ezekiel to see what disgusts him because when Ezekiel is a prophet, he's going to go out and speak what God's mind is to the people. He needs to own that himself. He needs to understand that. He needs to understand that. You know, there's an awful lot of wicked and evil on the face of the earth that we obviously don't have any idea of. I was watching the news today. Perhaps some of you saw the same broadcast. A woman whose husband had shot her in the face and had a face transplant, and this is an amazing thing, she had a face transplant, and her husband had, had shot her, and her whole face was basically just destroyed. And then he shot himself. And it was in the news, and, and I saw this woman. It's the first time that she's been seen in public. And, um, you know, she came walking out, and you see this poor woman, and her face has been under reconstruction, and and she at one time was a fairly attractive woman, but now for the rest of her life, she's going to be imprisoned in a face that has been mutilated because of an angry, drunken husband. Now, I don't know how you feel about things like that. I don't know if you even think about I don't even know if that's something you'd be concerned about or even care about. A lot of people would say, well, so what? Big deal. Who cares? I mean, why are you bringing that up? That's the whole point. The Lord sees those things. There are a lot of things that go on. Obviously, right now, there are things going on that are so heinous, so evil, so perverse and so twisted, so painful and so wrong throughout the world. With so many billions of people on the face of the earth, there are crimes taking place every second that we speak right now. There are horrible things being done to children. There are things being done to women. There are things being done to little kids. 
you know, that are unspeakable right now, taking place right now. And we are oblivious to that. We don't see it, but God does. When we went to um, Thailand, we did some ministry there a few years ago. And when we arrived in Thailand, we had an overnight stay in, in the capital city of Bangkok as we were about to move to a place called Phuket. So we spent the night in Bangkok. And while we were there with a team of ministers, while we were there at this hotel in Bangkok, some of the guys decided to leave to go get something to eat. So they went up to the con concierge at the, um, in the lobby, and they wanted to ask him, is there any restaurant open that we can go grab something to eat? Because our body time was still in the afternoon, though it was late at night then. And uh, you know what the concierge did? He asked them, would you like prostitutes? Do you want some prostitutes? And he had a book there on the desk. Now, this isn't a nice hotel. We're not talking about some, some dive somewhere. This is a nice hotel. And he brings out a book and opens it up and starts showing these men pictures of little boys. And he says, you can have any of these little boys. I can call and have one brought to you if you want a little boy. You see, Americans go into Thailand to have uh, homosexual relationships with little boys. They see these Americans. They assume that these Americans are there for what they would call a pleasure trip to go and have these little children, pedophiles. That was the first day that we were there. Now, some of you gasped. Some of you said, I could hear you. You made noise. That is everywhere. That's everywhere. We have slave trade going on right now. We have slavery going on where women are being kidnapped, sold into sexual slavery here in the United States. It happens all throughout the world. There are things going on right now that God sees that we don't see. And, and part of the problem is, is that we don't have a passion about righteousness because we don't have the heart that God wants us to have. And that's what's happening with Ezekiel, you see. That's why he's asking him this. Do you see this? Or are your eyes closed to it? Do you see this? Or have you stopped your ears so you don't have to hear it? Do you see this? Ezekiel, you have to see it. You have to see what I see to know my passion in order that you'll understand why judgment has to come on the nation of Israel. It has to. Because what's happening in the nation of Israel is to God an abomination because even in his temple... There is evil going on, and they are worshiping idols. And God said, I'm a jealous God. You see, we 21st century people, we, don't, we do not get it. We don't. Many, many years ago, I had a dream, and it was the weirdest dream I've ever had, to be honest with you. I still remember, and it's been 20, 20 years. I, and in a, it was in my dream, I, I started seeing, it was like flashes of murders and, and rapes. and I mean, it just flashes in the dream, and I woke up so greatly disturbed. I, I, I woke up because I saw so much evil taking place all at one time, and I remember waking up, and it was one of those, those dreams that you wake up kind of startled, and you look around the room, where am I? It's one of those. And, and for just a moment, I remember this like, like it was yesterday, for just a moment, it hit me. That's what God sees every second of the day. Every second of the day. He sees the evil that is taking place in nations like the United States and throughout this, obviously, throughout the world. He sees it all. He sees it all. Ezekiel, do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see what's taking place? Ezekiel, you need to understand because you have a message of judgment. I am bringing judgment on the nation of Israel. Judah is going to be destroyed. Jerusalem is going to be leveled. You need to understand what's taking place. Do you see it? And that's what the Lord wants Ezekiel to know, guys. That's what he would want us to know, by the way. If we have a desire in prayer, one of the prayers that I've prayed more than once over the years has been, God, break my heart for the things that break yours. Break my heart for the things that break yours. Because the only way that we're going to remain seriously intent on seeing people loving and serving God and being free from sin is when we begin to understand the depth of bondage that people really find themselves in 
and God's heart towards these things. And that's what we see here in the book of Ezekiel chapter 8. God wants Ezekiel to see these things. Ezekiel needs to see. So what he does is he lifts the veil for a moment and he allows Ezekiel to see the things that break God's heart. God sees all the wickedness and it grieves him. He sees all the wickedness and it provokes him. And if Ezekiel's going to be a preacher with passion, Ezekiel needs to see what tears at the heart of God. Because to preach with a sincere passion requires seeing what God sees, and secondly, a separation from the sins that are being practiced. You see, you're going to have a stronger ministry and a stronger heart to minister when the things of the world no longer have that allure for you, when you're no longer being drawn constantly by such basic things, less of the flesh, less of the eyes and pride of life, when you finally begin to realize you're just passing through, when those things, when that happens, things change in your life. They do. When a few years ago, a couple of years ago now, almost two years ago, when I lost my memory and I was in that hospital there in, in Miami and as I was laying in that bed there and I was in the hospital for three days trying to recover, I had a great time with the Lord because I began to ask myself and pray and I began to ask myself, what really matters? What really matters? You know, there are things that I can be distracted with that don't matter. And, and I was laying there and I started asking myself, what do I really need? What do I really need to survive? What do I really need to be happy? And you know what? I have to be honest with you. It boiled down to some very few, very few things. It boiled down to some very basic things. You know, it boiled down to having a wife who loved me. It boiled down to having children who loved me. It boiled down to having a grandson that loves his papa. It boiled down to basic things. The other things didn't matter anymore. The other things that I could find myself caught up with and concerned about and, and wondering about and worrying about and all of that, those things, I, I started thinking, man, it doesn't matter. Listen, when you've, been, when you've stood before a doctor and the doctor tells you in seven years you're going to lose your memory, I tell you, when you hear something like that, everything changes. Everything changes. And it changed for me when the doctor told me that. Though later on they said we made a mistake. Thank God for that mistake. I do remember that. Thank God for that. But everything, thank you for caring enough to clap. I appreciate that. But it's true. It's true. Some of us understand what I'm saying. You've had that 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock experience in your car when you're holding onto the steering wheel and you're saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I, I, God, what am I going to do? You've had that experience when somebody has called you and said, this has happened and something explodes. It's like a, a bomb blows up in your head and you don't know what you're going to do and you're just stunned and you're just holding on to that steering wheel. I've done that. I've been there. I've sat there like that and I've said, I don't know what I'm going to do. Everything at that point loses all of its allure, the world. Who cares if you have a nice car? Who cares if you have that, that TV set? Who cares if the Bruins lose again? Who cares? And it's, not, and it's not that you lose taste for life. It's that your taste is refined. It becomes refined. Listen, I go to the East Coast, and they try and feed me Mexican food. You don't want to eat East Coast Mexican food. You, you, you just don't want to do it. I mean, Taco Bell is good compared to what you get on the East Coast. I mean, though it's changing a little bit now. Now, you lose your taste for some things, and other things begin to have a greater sense in you of appreciation. Listen, if you want to have a powerful ministry, and this is between you and God, if you want to be somebody who's not just kind of just wasting time, but you really want to have 
a life that is used that really matters. For me, I do. I want to have a life that matters. You know, I, I, I mentioned this recently. I, I don't want, you know, a, a headstone that says 1950 and then whatever date it is that I go home to be with the Lord and just a line between them with nothing left behind, nothing that people would remember that was worth anything remembering. I don't want a life like that. I don't want a life like that. I want, when I leave, I want to leave a legacy, a heritage. I want to leave something that, that says, this man made a mark on his world while he was there. That's what I want. That's my dream. And I prayed a long time ago. I said, God, break my heart with the things that break yours. Help me to have a heart like that so I don't just spin my wheels. I was here and I'm gone. God, help me. And, and, and it comes by saying, Lord, what, what do you care about? What do you see and what do you want me to see so that I can have your heart be on the same page with you? And that's what's happening. And so the Lord is giving to him a, 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 a vision of what he sees. This is what's going on. This is why judgment is coming. He says in verse 7, so he, he brought me to the, the door of the court. When I looked, there was a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. He said to me, go in and, and see the wicked abominations which they're doing there. So I went in and saw, and there every sort of creeping thing abominable beasts, all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls, and there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in their midst stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand, a censer is representative of prayers, and a thick cloud of incense went up. He said to me, Son of man, you have seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark. Every man in the room of his idols. For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. So what does he see? Well, first, he's led to see a cult of elders of Israel who are secret idolaters. He's taken to a wall. He has to dig into the wall. He finds a door. What this is representative of is them hiding their sin. And, and what he sees is idolatry. Idolatry is taking place in the temple. He sees the elders as they're worshiping, and the temple is filled with images of idolatry. It, what's interesting is it speaks concerning all the various things that they have. Verse 10, it says, every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts, all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all, all around on the walls. And so their, their engravings is what you have there in the area that he sees what's taking place there in the, in the, in the temple. It's idolatry. We've been in, in Jerusalem many times, and we go to this one particular place. Uh, it's called the Burnt House. And you go to the Burnt House, and while you go into this place, this Burnt House, it was a priest's home. And as you're going through it and you're looking at this particular burnt house, in the priest's home, they found idols, idols in a priest's home. And the idols that they had, and I've seen idols in, in various parts of the world that have been unearthed and they have them in their museums. Many of those idols were in the form of, 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 of snakes or reptiles and, you know, cats various things like that. But there were a lot of fertility gods and goddesses that they worshipped. And what it is, it's pornography. What it is, is it's they're pornographic. And uh, because they worshipped uh, mothers, you know, they worshipped uh, fertility, you'd have women with exaggerated um, features on, their, on, their, on the carvings and all, and, and it just showed where their heads were. It was in they were, their, their paganism was, was many ways very sexual. And so what you're seeing here is the fruit of idolatry, and it's there in the temple. There was a lot of twistedness and a lot of perversion that he's seen. Now, when it speaks concerning the fact that they had creeping things and abominable beasts and all, it, it, it reminds us of what God had, had done when he removed the, the nation of Israel from, 
from, from Egyptian bondage. You know the story. You know what took place there in the book of Exodus, how that, that God had called a man by the name of Moses and, and had said to him, I have heard the cry of the nation of Israel and I have sent you to deliver them. And, and at first we know that Moses said, no, I, I can't speak. I'm slow of speech. I'm incapable. I don't even know who it is who's communicating to me. I don't even know your name. Who should I say sent me? And as he begins to debate and argue with the Lord and all, God says, look it, I'm going to use you and I want you to go and this is what you're going to do. Now, when you look at his, his uh, way of deliverance, we all know, because we saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, that there were ten plagues. And we know that the ten plagues that were brought on, on Egypt were escalating in nature. One of the things you may not know when you, when you see these ten plagues is that these plagues were actually judgments on the Egyptians' false gods. Each one of those plagues, those ten plagues, was a judgment on a god that the Egyptians would worship. In Exodus, in chapter 12, verse 12, God said, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. That's what those judgments were intended to do. It was to execute judgment on the Egyptians who worshipped abominable, creeping things and idols. You know how water was turned into blood, the first plague. Well, that was a judgment against a false god who was called Nileus a river god. There was a plague of frogs. That was against Hect, the false goddess of reproduction. There was a plague of lice, which was against Seb, the false god of the earth. There was beetles, not John, Paul, George, and Ringo. They were <laughs> like flies. That was against the sacred scarab. There was the plague on Egyptian cattle, which was against Apis and Hathor, the sacred bull and cow of Egypt. There were boils on man and beast, which was against Typhon, the evil eye false god. There was a plague of hail, which was against Shu, the false god of the atmosphere. There was a plague of locust against Serapis, the false protector from locust. There was a plague of darkness, which was against Ra, the sun god. And then there was the death of the firstborn of man and beast, which was against Ptah, the false god of life. Every one of these plagues was against a false god. So when you study that, you need to understand that. God said, I'm bringing judgment against them. And so what God had done is from the very beginning, he had said, you are not to have any false god or idol before me from the beginning of his working with that nation. But the heart of Israel is now sunken to idolatry. And these elders in verse 11 are actually revealing what they really worship. Now it's interesting how it says in verse 11, there stood before them 70 men of the elders. You see, in earlier days, God had appointed 70 elders and one of the duties that these 70 elders had was to protect the nation against idolatry. And yet what you have here is you have these men who are supposed to be protecting against idolatry. They are secret idolaters. And what's interesting in verse 11 is in their midst stands one named Jazaniah, who is the son of Shaphan. Now, why did he mention this man by name? In their midst to Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan. It's because... He was the son of a respected scribe, a scribe who read the book of the law to a righteous king by the name of Josiah. You see it in 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 8 through 11, which led to revival in the nation of Israel. And so this one here is a leader who actually had a godly father who, led, uh, who, who read the word of God to the king and the, and, and the king moved on the word of God and, and tore down the idols. This guy is his son, but he's not his son in the real sense of the word. He's there in the middle of it. Now, what's interesting, notice verse 12. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols. They say the Lord doesn't see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord doesn't see us. 
They thought they could get away with this. They thought that God couldn't see what they were doing. And God can. Hebrews tells us in chapter 4, verse 13, there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You can't hide. You know, it's like, it's like going into, your, into your, your home and everybody's gone and, and uh, so you, you get your uh, cable TV and you order one of those erotic movies. You think nobody... Nobody's going to know, and you'll hide the bill when it comes. Nobody's there, right? Or you hide that porn, you know, in one of the drawers underneath everything. You think nobody's ever going to pull this drawer out and look down there and see where I've hidden it. And you've got, you know, your computer now, and, and, and you, can, you can just get on that web and... There's a reason why it's called the web. Because it traps you. But you're by yourself. Everybody's in bed. Nobody even knows. You close the door in your office and bang, you turn on the computer and you stay there for hours looking at things. You know you're not supposed to do it. But you think nobody sees you. Nobody knows. You go on a business trip and, and you go into the section of town where you can find some of that, that literature and all of that. Or you go to some of those bars and... You think, nobody knows, nobody sees me, nobody knows me here. And who's going to know? Years ago, I was reading something about hotels in Las Vegas, and when a particular denomination, Christian denomination, showed up in this particular hotel, it was in, it was in a magazine, they pointed out, they said that their, uh, their uh, online porn sales go up every time the ministers showed up in town. Think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. Whenever this convention came into town, you know the bars and everything else? I can tell you stories. I have to be careful not to. I'll tell you one thing. When I was in Israel many, many years ago, I had a Reformed Jewess who was our guide. Her name was Helen. My wife Marie and I took a liking to Helen. Real upfront gal. And we liked her. And so she, she actually grew to like us. She was a, a guide for us on a few of our, of our um, trips to Israel. So she got to know us over the years, and so she began to open up to us. And then one day, without going into any details or giving any names, of course, I ought not to do that, and I won't. But this is what she told me. Marie and I are there with her, and she says, you know, and she mentioned this particular well-known organization, well-known man, and how he brings all these pastors with him on these trips. She said, you know so-and-so, and we said, we know of him. We don't know him. Yes, we know of him. She says, you know what happens every time he comes with his, with his tour? She tells us this. We're sitting down having a cup of coffee with Alan. I said, no, what happens? He says, they go to that bar right there. She said, and they sit there and they drink. When all of the people who are with them on the tour are in bed, they sit there at that bar. She says, I've seen it for years. These are your TV preachers, she says. And... They do it in front of us. She says, and you know why they do it in front of us? Now, this is her words. I'm simply quoting this friend of mine. She says, you know why they do it in front of us? Because we're only Jews. What does it matter? That's why. And I've never forgotten that. She told me that 15, 20 years ago. I've never forgotten that. We're only Jews. What does it matter? They hide from the people on the tour. She says, but you'll see them here after everybody's in bed drinking. And that, I'm telling you, is an abomination. And that's what God is saying. Do you see what they're doing? Do you see what they're doing? They have their secret sins. They think God doesn't see us. They think that they can close the door and they can remain there and nobody sees. And the point God is making is you can't get away with it. You may think that nobody knows you there. You may think that nobody sees you there. I have to tell you this. This is the truth before the Lord. I'm aware of, of, of those things. I have been in San Luis Obispo, because I've mentioned I go there often, well, at least twice a year to spend a few days there, because I love San Luis Obispo. That's a place that I really enjoy. And Marie and I will go there, and we go there with friends. And Marie and I have gotten up early on a Saturday. We've left our, our uh, hotel, 
And I can still remember walking on in one day at a, uh, at a, a shop that sells cookies, and Marie likes to eat cookies, I just watch her. And, um, <laughs> and I remember we were walking in when the door opens, it was seven, about 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, and there were already a couple of customers in, this, in the store, and the door opens as Marie and I are about to walk in, and so I reach over to take the door from the guy, and the guy looks right in my face, and he says, hi, Pastor David. He says, I go to your church. He says, you've mentioned San Luis Obispo so often. My wife and I decided to come and spend some time here. I've had three different times in San Luis Obispo, people who've walked up to me when I've been farmer's market or whatever, just walking. Hi, pastor, I go to your church. I, you know, it's nice to see you here. I've been at a place, we go to a place called McClintock's. I highly recommend it, by the way. McClintock's, great steaks and beans. And, uh, anyway, we go there. I'm, I'm leaving right now. I'm going to go to McClintock's. Now. But we... We go there, and I've had the waitress walk up and say, Hi, Pastor, how are you? I just moved up here. See, I've been on planes flying from New Mexico home, and I've, and I've, had, wait, I've had the stewardesses approach me and say, oh, I was in church today. I heard you give the message. I've been in New York. I've been so many places where people know who you are, so many places where you don't think they know you. You have to be aware of that. We were in Ontario, Marie and I, years ago now, a few years ago now, and we're going to fly out of Ontario. And, and they canceled our flight. And, and I was not a happy camper because the next flight's going to be out of Los Angeles. And, and we were there. We're ready to go. And, and, I, and I don't like traveling that much. And, and so they said the flight is canceled. And, and so I'm, I'm quiet. When I get upset, I get quiet. So I'm just kind of standing in line. And I'm, I'm not happy at all. I have to tell you, I am not happy. And Marie knows, so she's just kind of quietly standing there eating a cookie, and, and, as, <laughs> and as I'm standing in line, I'm waiting, and I go up to the, to the ticket counter because we have to exchange our tickets and get some other tickets and all of that, and so I'm not saying anything. I just put the tickets down there, and she looks at the tickets, and then she says, ID, please, and I hand her my license, and I'm just real quiet, and she looks at me. She says, David Rosales, and I say, yes. Oh, I listen to you on K-Wave all the time, and I'm like, oh, I'll praise the Lord, you know? <laughs> The hip hypocrisy, you know. <laughs> the Lord has a sense of humor. He really does. It's, oh, look at you. You got my joy now, don't you? <laughs> I don't, Jesus. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. You just never know. Nothing you do is in secret. You just never know who's watching you. I was in a restaurant here in the area a few years ago with a, a pastor friend of mine, and, and as we were there, he began to share some things that were pastoral, but they're the kinds of things that in confidence a pastor speaks to another, you know, it's not something that, that should be repeated or spoken about in a restaurant, and he, and he starts to speak, and he's from another city, he's not from this area, and I don't respond to what he's saying, I just smile at him, and he said something to me, and I just, I just smile at him. And I didn't respond. So we walk out. And I look to, uh, there's someone sitting here on my right. There's some other table right next to me on the left. I don't know who, who's there. And I look at him and, and I just don't say anything. And we walk out and I say, listen, you know, it's not that, that I, I think we ought not to have dealt with the issue that you wanted to bring up at that time. I said, it's a sensitive issue. It's not something that I would speak openly. I said, you never know. Who's around you? This was a Saturday. On Sunday, we had a baptism, and the person who was sitting right here on my right, I baptized that person. That person was sitting right next to us, and if I'd have opened up and shared anything or allowed him to, I could have stumbled a, a younger brother who was saying, I want to be right with God. And you have to be aware of the fact that you're never completely alone. Never. And these priests think they are. And that's what they're saying here. Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the room of his idols? They say the Lord does not see us. That is absolutely not true. Verse 13, he said to me, turn again and you will see greater abominations that they're doing. So he brought me to the house of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz. Tammuz was a deity 
an idol worshipped by ancient Babylonians. We don't know the name Tammuz, but we do know the name Adonis. Tammuz is equivalent to Greek Adonis. Adonis was the god of vegetation, the god of spring vegetation. And, and there was a rite where the women would mourn uh, when it was warm because um, that meant that he was dead and they were mourning his loss so that vegetation, they'd have a springtime of, of vegetation. And so they're worshiping this, this god of nature. And Adonis, I mean, we still use that word when people speak of uh, some extraordinarily handsome guy. They call him Adonis. They used to, I don't know if they say it anymore. They used to say, he's an Adonis. And what it, what it means is that he's well built, he's strong, he's, he's just good looking. And, and so they're weeping over this. And this, this speaks concerning immorality. So what it is, it's a combination of nature worship and sexual sin. And what happened is, is sexual sin came, came into the nation through sexual license, there is a form, that's a form of, of idolatry. When you, when you worship nature, you also worship sexual expressions because sex is part of your nature. And what happens is you begin to worship the creation rather than the creator. And so what you begin to do is you begin to worship certain things above God and His Word. You worship creation, not the creator. That explains why, and this has always really, really been interesting to me, you will see pro-abortionists attacking Japanese whaling vessels. That trips me out. They think it's wrong to kill a whale, but they don't think it's wrong to kill a human being. And that amazes me that they will go out and attack a Japanese vessel that is a whaling vessel. And by the way, I don't think they should hunt down whales, to be honest with you. That's just my opinion on that subject. But at the same time, they're pro-abortion, but they're also pro-animal. But animal in the sense of a whale or a dog. Some believe that animal rights are very important. So they champion animal rights but they also champion abortion rights. It's amazing to me. During this time, some believe that this worship of Adonis, this worship of Tammuz, was a way for women to have a sense of liberation. But for Ezekiel, Ezekiel was horrified when he saw what was taking place. You know, it's been said, and I think it's rightly so, it's been said that a pagan, a pagan in 1950 had a better quality of morals than many Christians in the year 2009. Because some of us can remember that in situation comedies like the oldies that you'll see sometimes like I Love Lucy and Lucy of all, and uh, Desi Arnaz, married couple in real life. You watch some of those old comedies, they never, even though they show their bedroom, they, they never have the same bed. They're never in the same bed. There's always two beds because there was a decency. There was, that was something that was a decency. I don't know how many of you guys remember Archie Bunker, All in the Family or whatever it was. But they made a big deal out of the fact that in his program, when it was out, when it first came out, it was the first time on television that you actually hear a toilet being flushed on TV. That was a real big thing because you didn't have toilets flushed and toilet humor. You didn't have any of that. See, you younger people don't understand why some of the older people just pull their hair out saying, I, I, I don't get this. My mom... Uh, whenever I talk to my mom, my mom will say, David, I can't even watch comedies because they're, they're, they're nasty. They, they say dirty things. But there are so many people who are, have been just basically so hardened and callous by it, don't even know how to blush. You know, it's an amazing thing today when somebody actually is embarrassed and blushes 
because there's an entire generation that doesn't know how to blush because nothing, nothing embarrasses them because they've seen so much. And they call it a liberation even to this day. You'll hear about women who are in their 50s posing nude for Playboy, Playboy or some magazine, and when asked, why did you do that? They say, I sensed a, a, a personal liberation. You know, it was just, and I'm thinking, how sad is that? At that age, you haven't grown. You have no decency and no modesty. How sad is that? that you never grew beyond that. That's what we have. You know, when George Barna was interviewing and took a poll of 18 to 25-year-olds, what kind of, of uh, bad things did you do last week? And he, he spoke to a number of uh, people between 18 and 25. 38% of them said they had illicit sex last week. And 33% said they viewed porn. It is a sexual reality in this society. And that's what he's weeping over as he sees them as they have given themselves over to sexual sin. Verse 15, he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They were worshiping the sun toward the east. These are priests, 25 men. They're in the most holy place, and instead of worshiping God, they are actually worshiping the sun. These 25 men represented the 24 divisions of priests in Israel as well as the high priest. And what this is a picture of is a complete rejection of the God of Israel who is the creator of all things. Instead of worshiping God, they are now worshiping the sun. Now the sun is intended, and I don't know if you realize this or not, the sun is intended in God's creation to be one of the, one of the premier things that he created. I mean, all of us here in Southern California, all of us, and I'm sure that this is true everywhere, really, but, you know, you get up in the morning sometimes, Saturday morning, and, you know, you wake up early, though you could sleep in late, you choose not to, and, and as Marie and I have, and we get up early, and, and you go outside, and, and, uh, and you take a walk, and as we walk through the neighborhood, Marie will say this, she'll say, what a beautiful day, isn't it a beautiful day? And, and you look around and I, and I say, no, I'm having to take a walk, I hate this. No I'll, no, I'll look and I'll say, it is, what a beautiful, and, and you feel the warmth of the sun in the morning and, and it just invigorates you, it's just something about it. God created the heavens and the earth to bring glory to him. It says in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. That is a picture of how gracious God has been to us to give us the joy of a sun that keeps us warm and gives us the ability to survive. And what are they doing? They're worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Have you seen this, he said? The priests who should be teaching people to worship me, are pagans. He said to me, verse 17, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. That's another way of speaking of an insulting. They're insulting me. And therefore... I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. This nation has turned the back on me, from the elders, the women, and the priests. 
They've turned their backs on me. They've chosen to, to follow idolatry. And the thing we'll close with, the thing is when he says, is it a trivial thing? We have to ask ourselves that. Is it a trivial thing? Is it a trivial thing to live in a nation that rejects God? Is it a trivial thing to have a nation that continues to, to reject the things of the Lord? Is it a trivial thing for us to pass laws that enable ungodly behavior to be legalized and become morally acceptable? Because Americans have a general belief that if it's legal, it must be also moral. I don't know about you, but I'll say this, and forgive me if it bothers you. But it saddens me to know that on the National Day of Prayer, our president doesn't feel it's necessary to be part of that. That does bother me. I don't know if it bothers you, but it bothers me. Because if there's anything that this nation needs, it needs a leader who understands the importance of prayer. Do you agree with that? I really believe that. I really do. And with that in mind, I'll be seeing you tomorrow night at the National Day of Prayer, won't I? Yeah. Because while you may agree with it, it's better for you to actually be there.